Well, hello, everybody. Welcome to the call tonight. Uh, my name is Michael Ambrosio from uh, MikeAmbrosio.com. Uh, I'm here today with uh, Willie Crawford from TheRealSecrets.com. Today, Willie and I are going to talk to you about uh, just how easy it is to create your own information products and easily sell them online. Anybody who knows Willie knows he's been making his living selling his own products online since probably about 1997, so he's an old-timer at this. Uh, so Willie, why don't you start off with telling our listeners a little bit about yourself? Okay. I'm going to take it into presentation mode, too, so that we uh, mute all the listeners. Are you still there? I'm still here. Okay. And you noticed that the background noise dropped out, so we're now in presentation mode, which means only you and I can talk. Uh, and I'll begin with a disclaimer, first of all, uh, that the information we're going to give the callers on this call is for informational purposes only since we don't know their level of skills and we can't guarantee the results they get from using what we pass along. So uh, they assume our responsibility for what they do with the information we give. We're not making any promises of any specific earnings and things along that line. And since the call is being recorded, all rights to the call are reserved by Willie Crawford Incorporated and Michael Ambrosia. Uh, we're jointly um, sharing ownership of the call. And with that out of the way, and that, that legal lease, uh, I have been online since late 1996. I've created and sold dozens of information products, with the, the simplest being uh, teleseminar recordings like the one we're doing today. Uh, many of those products I've you know had transcribed and expanded into ebooks and audio tapes, CV, CDs, DVDs, and even expanded and followed into courses and things like that. So I've, I've done quite a few information products. I do a lot of teleseminars and I record those to generate information products to sell either standalone products or to use as bonuses with other things along that line. So uh, I do quite a bit of that. Uh, I speak quite a bit at seminars. That's where Michael and I met. Uh, out in um, at, at Ken Calhoun Seminar out in Denver, for example. Um, in the next four months, I'm speaking in London, I'm speaking in Sydney, I'm speaking in Phoenix, I'm in New York, Atlanta, and I'm attending a seminar in New Orleans where I was invited to speak but would rather just learn at that one. Wow, you're a busy man. <laughs> yeah, yeah. My, my wife's looking forward to Australia and London, though, so... Uh, It'll be fun. Well, I can imagine. I'd, I'd look forward to that, too. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Part of the Internet lifestyle. And and my, my real secret is that I watched what others were doing. I did go to a lot of seminars and, and listened really closely at what they were doing. And I had a coach who taught me that we're all going to make mistakes. We may as well get them out of the way. So he said, you know, you're going to fail at some things, so go ahead and get those out of the way. Fail fast, and then you'll learn from your mistakes and move on. And that's what I've done. And uh now I'm not afraid to try new things, and I do quite well with it. Yeah, I think that's pretty uh, pretty good advice there. I, I'm going through the same thing right now as we speak. You know, I, I've done a lot of uh, things online that I, I probably shouldn't have, but heck, I learned something from it, and now uh, uh, I'm applying that to my, my future, and it's, it's working out pretty nicely. Right, as, as long as you don't keep making the same mistakes over and over <laughs> again, uh, that is still learn from them. <laughs> okay, uh, well, we have a lot of information to cover, so uh, why don't we just jump right on into this. All right. Uh, you know, we want to cover as many of these questions uh, that were emailed in by our listeners as possible, so uh, we'll just get right on this. All right. Uh, so, Willie, uh, you suggested titling this uh, call, How to Create an Info Product in Under a Day That Will Make You $100,000 Per Year. You know, personally, I think that sounds like a big challenge. Uh, exactly how do you suggest somebody pull off this feat? Well, as I alluded to earlier, I, I do a lot of teleseminars, and the easiest product in the world to do is uh, to put on a teleseminar on a hot topic, uh, record it, turn it into an MP3 uh, product or and or PDF if you have it transcribed, and then sell it from your website. And if you get it on the right topic, you can sell the recording from a call like this for um, you know $97 or so. I have friends doing it all the time. So it it doesn't take a lot to make hundred thousand dollars. You're talking uh, less than two thousand dollars per week, and if you've got a product sell for hundred dollars, that's only twenty copies you know, per week. It's not that hard to do, and basically people are going on the internet and they're looking for information, they're looking for solutions to their problems, and so it's a matter of figuring out what problem people are trying to solve. And, and putting together information products on those problems. And quite often, you don't have to use your own knowledge, as I'm sure you're aware. You can find an expert, you know, find a doctor, a lawyer, a dietitian, a real estate person, or whatever, and, and tell them uh, that you'd like to make them famous. You know, not in those words, but tell them you can help them to get more business, uh, and you'll do it by interviewing them and putting the interview online where you're selling the interview, but 
all trails also lead back to them and more business for them. And you'll be surprised at how many uh, experts will agree to go along with you on a project like that for the publicity value. So in a nutshell, you're, what you're saying here is uh, that you know, the real secret really is you just offer people something that they've told you that they actually want, they've proven that, to, that they're willing to pay for it, and then go so far as to find an expert in that niche or that field and uh, you know interview them and make a, an info product out of that? Right, uh, and, and I think it's very important that they not only, you know, a lot, a lot of people want to get ready to make an info product, they survey people, things along that line, and, and use that as an indicator of what product they should create. And I think that you not only do you want to do that, but you want to have them prove to you that they want the product by having them buy the product from you already. And that's something we can we can get into a little later. Uh, you and I probably both notice uh, people who come online and they they come up with a brilliant idea and they think you know this is the greatest thing since sliced bread. Nobody else is doing it. I'm going to create a product about this. And they create the product, and a lot of them come to me for help on selling the product. And the problem is that. A lot of times it's a product that people uh, don't want or they're unwilling to pay for. They're, they're, the, the, the people in the marketplace expect to get it maybe for free or something. And so uh, that's going about it backwards. Instead of developing a product and finding a market, you need to find the market, figure out what that market wants, and then give it to them. Well, that makes a lot of sense to me, and it's actually the, one of the pitfalls that I've found myself into early on in my online career as well, creating a product first and then trying to search out a market. Uh, it's flopped miserably. So I, I think I, we all have. <laughs> <laughs> you know, the funny thing is, though, that most people who make info products, you know, they, they slave over them for weeks, months. Uh, but what you're saying here is that you, you can literally do one of these in, in, in the fraction of the time. Is, is that right? How, does, how, how can one do that? Well, the, the easiest way, again, is to uh, just find, get yourself a bridge line, like I mean, we're using tonight where we can all dial into the same number and, and get a number of people, a number of experts on the call. I mean, it's, tonight it's just you and I talking mainly, but we could have had a whole panel of experts, uh, all experts on a similar topic, and we could have created a product from that. Uh, you can also uh, just get a ghostwriter to, to do a product for you, and that's not really in a day, but you could do that. You can also... I use public domain information and, and create your own product, create what's called a derivative, which is where you take something that's public domain and you add your own spin to it so that you know, you've added some of your own thoughts, some of your own content, where it's uh, different enough that you can copyright it as your own if you want to. You don't have to copyright it. You can just use public domain works as they are and market them. But if you make it a derivative where it's significantly different, then you can copyright that work. Uh, examples are uh, I, I spent uh, time in the military and I was a martial artist, and one of my favorite books was uh, Sun Tzu's On War. And I noticed uh, at one time there were versions of this book for business people and versions for martial artists and versions for about ten other different career fields, and it was that, you know, different people liked the precepts taught in the book, and so they just put their spin on it and, and then wrote their own versions that explained Sun Tzu's principles, and, and they had a book that they could publish, and I, I imagine most of them didn't spend a lot of time actually doing the writing, you know, once they'd fallen in love with the book in the first place, it was easy for them. So it's easy to come up with a, a derivative product from public domain works. Uh, another thing you can do is, especially for people like you and I who are in the Internet marketing arena, is take some of these tens of thousands of reprint right products that seem to be out there, Repackage them, uh, combine them in, in, in different ways, and uh, rewrite the sales copy so that it emphasizes different aspects of, of the product package. You know, some of these packages will list you know 20 different products, and they just barely touch the surface of what each of the products in the package can do. Someone who's a, who puts the time into copywriting it and really, really spells out the benefits of all the different parts and pieces of that package probably do very well with uh, reprint rights packages that they've had you know, for a long time. And uh, another thing to do is just to create an alternative format for pre-existing products. There, uh, you have somebody who's written an e-book and you suggest them that maybe it be recorded and, and you make an audio tape or something and if you aren't happy with your voice, you can even hire someone to sit there and read the book, you know, and you make, a, you make a product out of it. Or you find the person who's written the book and who's very excited because it's their book in the first place, and you suggest that you do an audio product, not necessarily just reading the book, but discussing the points or the, the precepts in the book. And, and I honestly think you could put together something like that in a day or so. 
and, and it was so well. Well, apparently there's there's plenty of places to get information to, to make uh, info products out of that. That's obvious. That, thanks for all those tips. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but uh, but now that brings up another question, though. Uh, with all the information that's out there, you know, uh, what types of topics do you suggest people create these products on, and and why? Well, uh, my favorite topics lately, my favorite topics actually health-related topics, and the reason for that is because the biggest segment of our population, and then probably the biggest segment of the world's population, is people born in the, during the, the baby boom, and, and those people are now in their 50s, maybe early even 60s and 40s, and, and they're um, they're concerned about aging and their health and and the shape of the world and everything. So you find out what they're concerned about uh, everything from being overweight to you know all of the health problems and and you just uh, create products that they're interested in and at the same time because those people are their kids are now young adults uh, that's probably one of the second that's probably the second biggest wave of people in the population right now so you can create products for those people and even for the next generation because these baby boomers are becoming grandparents now and they spend lots of money on things um, to make their grandchildren smarter you know <laughs> but you just you just get in front of them and health related uh, money related uh, again these baby boomers are approaching retirement age want to feel secure in retirement uh, so how to make money I mean when you and I go to seminars you, you we, I noticed that you know, there, there are probably more people over 50 than there are under 20, you know. Yeah, yeah I would agree with that one. I, I, even though you think that it's all these teenagers that are these computer gurus, uh, there's a lot of, you know, uh, seniors there that uh, are learning to make money because they, they are tired of working for corporate America or whatever. And so you can create products for them, teach them how to make money, how to save money, uh, products, uh, information products on Pets on hobbies, uh, on employment. There's people I think still having trouble in the economy finding jobs. Even uh, politics and religion. You know, you can create information products on any of those topics, and they should do do well. Yeah, those are pretty hot topics. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> okay. So this is great. So now we we've got a whole lot of resources here: public domain information, reprint rights, and even some great suggested topics. Now you've got a great idea in mind. How do you how do you research the market to prove that there's a demand? Well, I, I use a number of um, tools. Um, I'm sure you're familiar with Word Tracker. Oh yes. Uh, you know, Word Tracker basically shows you what terms were searched the most often on the internet over the last uh, whatever time period you're looking at, and and you can get a list of you know 10,000 words if you want or phrases, and it just lets you see what people are searching for, what they're searching on, and it rank orders them. Uh, I use that to see what people are searching on. I use uh, the Overture Suggestion Tool, and I, I, I have a list of uh, bits people are making at the pay-per-click search engines on um, both Overture and even on uh, Google, and it tells me not only what people are are searching for, but what marketers are spending money to advertise and to me that's a better indicator of what's going to be profitable because I don't think a marketer is going to spend continuously spend money on say pay per click advertising unless they're getting a decent return on investment. Makes sense. So I look at what markets they're spending a lot of money on and that tells me uh you know, potential topics of interest. Um I, I browse the local bookstores. I don't do that as much as I used to because I get so many books in the mail that I don't need to as much. But what that tells you is what topics are hot. Again, you, you look at um, shelf space in the stores. Uh, stores have to make a decent return on investment, too, and the bookstores are going to devote the most space on the shelf to the hottest selling topics. They're also going to take the very hottest selling topics and, and have the book turn so that the full cover of the book is facing you. So that tells you what's really, really, really hot right now. Uh, you can do the same thing with magazines. Go to a magazine stand, browse the magazine stand. Uh, and if there are many, many, many magazines on a given topic, that tells you that there is a huge market for that. And if you browse those magazines and you see lots of advertisements in the back, that tells you that there's a huge market for the types of products being advertised in the magazine. So it's, it's, it's really studying the marketplace, studying what people are buying and what – it's being proven to sell by what you see advertised in magazines and newspapers and things like that. Uh, you could go to Amazon.com. They give you a list of the best-selling books, and, and they break them down by category. Uh, you could go to the library and grab a copy of a standard rate and data system, which is um, 
what is the standard rating data survey? SRDS, which is a list of every mailing list in the world that's available, and it, it basically shows you who's buying what and how many people are in each group. And uh, so it gives you some ideas of, of what people have bought in the last uh, month, two months, three months. So, again, it's an excellent research tool. So all these research tools are right at your disposal, too. They're all right at your disposal. Most of them cost you absolutely nothing. I mean, SRDS is uh, it's expensive if you purchase a subscription, but uh, most public libraries have, have a copy that you can... Yes, even my small town library has one. I can confirm that. <laughs> good, good. Well, this is great. So now we've got an idea for a topic. We've got some public domain information and stuff like that. And you think you've got a hot market. Now, now how do you confirm that people actually buy the product that you have in mind before you go through the trouble of, of creating the, the, the product? My, my favorite tool is the, the Ask database. Are you familiar with that? Yes, I am. Okay, the Ask database basically lets someone uh, let you conduct a survey and the you you pay for a subscription and you collect your survey. So people go to your web page, they fill in a form. Uh, you may ask a question like, "What is your biggest concern about? Uh, I don't know, uh, gout or uh, you know, high blood pressure, whatever." And, and people fill in the answer, and you can require that they give you the email address or offer them a free gift or something. And what I do is, after they've filled in the survey, I send them to a thank you page that offers them a product that um, solves that problem. So what I do is I go to like ClickBank or one of these affiliate program networks. I find a product that already serves the market I'm, I'm uh, looking to develop a product in, and I advertise that product on the thank you page. So they they answer my question, and they submit their name and address or just the, the email address, and then they're uh, taken to a thank you page where I offer them the product, and I notice what percentage of people actually buy the product that's similar to what I plan on creating. And then that tells me whether or not there's enough demand for it. Afterwards, uh, the Ask database also helps me in, in uh, writing my, my copy because if you ask people, you know, what's your, your most pressing concern about, you know, uh, having enough money for retirement, if you get the same answer over and over and over again, you know that that's a, a big concern. So you emphasize that in your advertising copy right at the top. You know, that's the biggest concern. And then you just rank order the answers people gave you, and you've basically written your sales copy. And uh, you also, if you uh, are creating a product, uh, you can just hand this, these questions or concerns to a ghostwriter and have them do it for you. Although I don't use ghostwriters as much as a lot of other people do, uh, just because I have a... I'm rather picky about the quality of my work, and uh, I've had a lot of people buy products that were written by ghostwriters that were less than satisfactory, you know, <laughs> so I'm picky there. But that, that's my process in, in, a, in a nutshell. And once I've developed a product, uh, I can continue to drive traffic through my, my Ask page and just uh, have them go to my product page then. And uh, all, all the Ask campaign is doing is I'm using pay-per-click search engines primarily to send people to maybe prompt them a free report or ask them to complete a survey for some type of a bribe, and I'm just driving traffic to that page to confirm people are willing to spend money on it. Uh, pretty simple process. For the benefit of those who have never heard of uh, Ask Database, can, can you tell us where to find that? I think it's at ask.com, Okay. Just I'm, I'm not certain. I'll, I'll look that up, though. Uh, no. if, if they just type it in any of the search engine, Ask Database, that they'd find it. Okay. All right. Well, they we're getting some great information here. Uh, we've, we've talked about a lot about creating products, uh, public domain, and I have a, another question about public domain. Okay. Uh, there's always that question about uh, infringing on a, or violating on a copyright. Um, how, do you, how can you tell if something's in the public domain, and, and how do you go about confirming you're not violating copyrights? The, the absolute best way to do it is to, is to use a copyright lawyer. Uh, I mean, there's, there's rules, that, and... and uh, Things that were written like pre-1934, most of those are public domain. Anything that's uh, written by the government is public domain. Uh, the, the thing is, a lot of things that were that you can, that you do assume are public domain may not be because some foundation or someone that was related to the author may have renewed the the copyright. So what you really want to do is you want to uh, investigate the copyright and. There's a, the copyright office is at uh, copyright.gov. They actually offer a service where they will research whether or not something is actually in the public domain. Oh, well, that's good. That's, that's handy. <laughs> they'll charge you for it, but they'll do that. Uh, another um, thing you can do is I, I, I actually buy 
uh, public domain works that have been researched. You know, there's uh, websites out there that sell you public domain works. They certified their researchers and lawyers have confirmed the um, copyright on. And, and uh, I, I love stuff that's uh, put out by the U.S. government because, you know, if, if I'm writing a report on West Nile virus or something like that, I know that the U.S. government, uh, since it's one of their duties is to protect its citizens or any government, is to protect the citizens. Um, they've done all kinds of research. They've spent hundreds of millions of dollars already researching a topic. You know, they already know what causes all the major health problems and, and what does and doesn't work, and you know what's quackery and stuff like that. So, you, you just go to their sites and you, you can find the information. And very often, uh, it says right on there that you're free to use it. Uh, sometimes they'll have some information that they got from private uh, foundations or organizations. So you have to check to make sure that it, it, it wasn't doesn't belong to some private organization that's copyrighted. But otherwise, you're free to use that information in any way you want to. Well, you know that that's a gem of a of a resource right there is government pages. And uh, you know it's funny how many people actually don't realize that. Uh, but but since we're on the public uh, the, the topic of getting public domain information, is there any other ways or easier ways you can get public domain stuff? I, I am I'm a member of several uh, membership sites, if you will. Uh, like I said, I, I buy the stuff, uh, the, and the membership's only like 20, 30 bucks a month. I'm a member of, of a site that Russell Brunson has called The Lost Files, for example. Okay. And every month he puts out the X number of uh, public domain works. There's another one called nichepd.com. Uh, every month they put out uh, four or five uh, public domain works that they've gone through, confirmed the copyrights on, and they offer it to their membership. And what you do is you take these and hopefully not just republish it as it is. You know, you don't want to take a book that was written in 1930 and just republish it. You want to somehow change it and bring it up to date. But it, you can do that with minimal work. So that's what I do. Uh, and I find that I have actually more public domain works than I'll ever really use. Yeah, I've got, I've got a, a complete list myself. Uh, and I'm, I'm working through them one at a time. <laughs> yeah. It's a lot of work. I, I, I mean, I have my good money off of them. I, I went on to the website at, uh, what was it, the, the Gutenberg Project site. Yes. And I found a, a cookbook that was written in 19, sorry, 1893. Some church group wrote it, and it was public domain. I took it, and I um, explained some of the terminology and did a few other things to create a derivative. It took me probably half a day. And then I started selling this cookbook from my, my, one of my websites, and, and it sells not every day, but every week I sell quite a few copies of it. And another good resource is a, a, a site called alibris.com. that They're right. just public domain, but, but if you search, you can search through, uh, you know, uh, years that things are published by authors, however you want. You can find some really good public domain books, uh, and they're at a very good price, I might add, too. Right, and that's uh, alibris, that's at what, A-L-I-B-R-I-S? You got it, dot com. All right, let's uh, let's shift gears just a little bit. I wanted to talk a little bit about uh, pricing your product. You know, that that's pretty important. How, how do you come up with a pricing strategy? How do you know what's the right price? Well, I, I find that uh, split testing works best, and, and, and most people that are new to pricing a product tend to price their products too cheap. They, they tend to go for the low end, figuring that if they charge too much, they won't make any sales. But if you study sales psychology, if you study human behavior, you know that in the absence of other evidence, people base uh, base their decision based how high a quality they think something is on price. And so you can price something more expensive in the marketplace and actually make more sales than you price it less expensive. And I tend to do that a lot of times. But I also look at what all the other products related, similar products, are, are selling for. And I start with that as a starting point, but then I tend to price mine toward the higher end of the marketplace a lot of times. You know, that that uh, tending to be cheap is, is something that I've been uh, <laughs> uh, done myself. I, I've had an e-book that I, I priced out at, you know, 14.97, thinking, wow, this is great. I'll get 100 sales and, you know, three sales. And uh, six months later, uh, it was I was advised after somebody evaluated, now bring that up, $47. And, and it did increase my sales quite a bit. I, I, was, I was kind of in, uh, in awe. <laughs> yeah, it, it's like you, you buy a book in a bookstore, you're used to paying $14, $15. Uh, and if you were to print out your book and sell it in a bookstore, that may be all you could get for it. But if you, but when you're selling it over the Internet, 
there's, you're implying maybe that the information is, is more rare, that it, it's harder to come by or something, and, and it's just thought of differently. Uh, and, and that's why I don't really push people to take their e-books and put them in bookstores other than for one reason, and that is that when you have a print book, uh, it, it gives you another credential because anybody can type out a Microsoft Word document, turn it into a PDF, and say they've written a book. Yes. But not anybody can say, look, I've got a print book. So you, you do want to maybe have some copies of your print book, but you're going to make less money if you put it in the bookstore than you would if you sell it off your site. I mean, all things being equal. True. People just simply won't pay as much for uh, paperback or a thin book as they would for the same information in, in, uh, off the Internet. Yeah, I've, I've seen that before, too. You're, you're absolutely right about that. <laughs> okay, um, you talked about split testing for, for, for testing your prices. Do you, do you have any other uh, uh, methods that you prefer to, to, to test your pricing and also to test other you know, facets of your, your product promotion? Uh, primarily split test. I mean, it, it, it's putting the price putting the product out there on the sales page and really once the product is created it's all in the marketing it's it's all in how you present the product you've got to build value in your customer's mind and, and so a lot of that is is copywriting you know, which uh, I don't necessarily teach but I, I do a lot of copywriting I, I just have this huge swipe file of things that I know work because I know how much some people sold of their products, and I know they work because I know that when I first saw the advertisement, something about it grabbed me, and so I, I have a huge swipe file, and I have actually several copywriting courses that I refer to all the time. I, I've, I've found that actually the product creation is the easy part. There, there are, I'd say the majority of Internet marketers who create the product have a great product. Their problem is that they, they can't market effectively. Well, yeah, marketing and, and also you just mentioned writing copy. Uh, I know my, I myself, uh, I farm it out whenever I can because it's a struggle. Uh, it'll take me more than a week to, to get my, my rough draft out. And it's painful for me because I'm not much uh, of a copywriter. Uh, do you have any secrets there for, for writing your copy? Uh, yeah, I, I cheat. I, I don't start from scratch. I, I take a sales letter and... Uh, like most professional copywriters, I, I take a headline that I really like that somebody else is already using, uh, and I just change a few words in it. That, that's all. I mean, if you watch uh, any of the big-name copywriters, they'll tell you that they have these huge swipe files. I mean, somebody like Dan Kennedy has file cabinet after file cabinet after file cabinet of swipe files. And so they don't start from scratch. They start from, how can I rework this headline to make it fit my product? How can I rework this guarantee to make it fit my product? How can I rework uh, these bullet points and, and um, you know, how much work and effort it takes to go into this product, things like that. And they don't start from scratch. I don't start from scratch. I, I have no problem with seeing a, a, a web page that I really, really like and asking myself, how can I borrow elements of that web page? Don't steal their stuff outright, but um, certainly borrow parts of it. Oh, sure. I, I've heard that before, so uh, I guess that's the right answer. <laughs> yeah. That would help me because uh, I, writing from scratch doesn't, doesn't agree with me. I can, I, can, I can be honest about that. So. I mean, right now, for the Internet marketers, one of the most copied uh, websites out there is John Reese's Traffic Secrets site that, that Michael Fortin wrote. And, uh, you know, you can be surfing across the Internet and you'll see web pages with the exact same colors and uh, same styles of headline and everything, and why not? It, it worked. You know. Sure, don't reinvent the wheel, right? Right, don't, don't reinvent the wheel. That's, that's, that's really important. Uh, that was one of the things that I, I probably learned a little late in the game, and, and now I firmly believe in going for the low-hanging fruit. You know, just there's people out there telling you what they want, and, and they're telling you they're willing to pay for it, so don't dream up huge, huge projects when you don't need to. Go with simple projects that are – I like projects that are, that are – quick to put out that I can put together in um, a week or two at the most. I know and another another thing that, that, that you're really into that, uh, that I've kind of noticed, I've been following you for, for quite a few years, is you're big on getting others to help you promote your products and stuff. Um, can you tell us a little bit about uh, how and why you use affiliate programs and uh, joint venture partners? Yeah, it, it's that the um, – my, my, I have a list that's pretty substantial, but there's – you know, I'm still not reaching 99% of the marketplace, and so when I use a joint venture partner or affiliates, I'm only paying for performance. You're only paying them when they 
put your product in front of their audience and, and there's actual sales made. It's not costing you anything. A lot of people think that they're, they're losing money by sharing it, but you're just gaining sales you would not have had otherwise, and so it just makes perfect sense to me. You're also gaining exposure to a whole new market. When, when a, a joint venture partner, um, you know, I, I watched John Reese's Traffic Secrets thing to get back to that real quick, and the, the beauty of it to me was that he was selling a course that was $997, and all of his joint venture partners were saying, everybody on my list is willing to spend $1,000 to grow their business, raise your hand. And then he was just the, the JV partner was basically saying to John, okay, here's a list of all those people who are willing to spend that kind of money on their business. These are serious people, and I'm giving you the best people on my list. And, and now they're because of John's customers are a part of his list. So uh, to me, it's, it, I, I think of things in that, that fashion. So that's a pretty good strategy, not just from the standpoint of, of helping get the word out about a product, but also about building your own list as well. Is that right? Right. You, you, once that customer is yours, depending upon how the affiliate program is structured, uh, they're yours. I mean, you can have an affiliate program that pays lifetime commissions on, on all sales, but still you, you've uh, identified some really good customers, and so it just makes sense to partner with uh, others. And at the same time, I, I spent probably my first two, two and a half years on the Internet thinking that the world was my competition, and, and um, I think it was Jonathan Mizell that sort of reshaped my thinking and, and pointed out that they're not your co competition, they're potential partners. Look for ways to work with them. If you both sell to the same market, look for ways to work with them, uh, offer your products or their products as back in, and, and, and you'll all do better. And he, Jonathan also, you know, he said, when you go to a, a magazine store and you're looking for a magazine, say, on uh, running or something, you don't usually buy just one. You usually buy a bunch of them, right? Yep. So your customers that are in a particular niche, uh, they're going to buy your competitor's product, and they're probably going to buy yours too. If, if it's um, something they're really passionate about, they'll have an insatiable appetite for more information. They'll read everything they can get their hands on, and then they'll think there must be more, and they'll keep looking. You know, And, and a lot of them won't even do anything with the information they purchase, but they'll keep looking. You know, that is true. I mean, uh, as a passion, I, I love drumming, and, and I'll buy whatever I can find on, on drumming. It doesn't matter, you know, who the who's putting out that particular product. So I understand that when, you have, when you're you looking for a, a target market with a passion, you know, yeah, they're going to buy a whole bunch of stuff if, if it's related to what they really want. I always look for something more, something, you know, thinking that there, there's a, some secret I haven't discovered. There's some new twist that is going to make me the best in that niche or, or you know, it's going to be some major breakthrough for me. True. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but but here's, here's a bit of a personal one for you. Um, when you make these, these info products, is it your plan and your goal to make $100,000 a year off of every info product that you personally put out? No. Uh, I, I think it was Tony Blake that hammered into me that uh, you're not going to hit a home run with every product. Uh, that some products you're just going to sell, you know, uh, they're going to sell. What, you, what I look for is to create a product that's going to be an evergreen product, that's going to be a perennial seller, and I want to make sure I'm selling them and they'll continue to sell for a long time. But if I have a product that's making me, uh, I don't know, a thousand dollars a week is great. A thousand dollars a month, if it's a product that only took me uh, uh, half a day to create and it's going to do that for five years, and that's a good return on investment, too, in, in my opinion. And the thing with me and with all my products and the thing that you have to do is you have to build back end in every product. Every product needs to, in some way, encourage your customer to look at other products you have. And when you look at it that way, you don't need to make as much on, on, on the front end or on the first product. You, you certainly want products that are going to make you a million dollars, but, uh, again, um, you know, if you've got a product that's making you a thousand dollars a month, a couple thousand dollars a month, and it only took you a little while to put it together, you you create that product and you go on to the next product. Well, it makes perfect sense. It, kind of using a baseball analogy, it's like going for the base hit. You'll you'll get a lot more of those and you will home runs, but the base hits will produce more runs for you in the long run. Absolutely. Sure, it makes perfect sense. <laughs> Well, um, on the the whole product note, there, how, how do you squeeze the most out of every product that you produce? Yeah, what I do is I, I look for as many formats as practical with with any bit of uh, information I have. Uh, you know, you start out with a, like a teleseminar like this or an ebook, and you you ask yourself, can I 
turn that, can I expand on that information and turn it into a bigger product by adding some bonuses to it when I sell it from a web page? Can I turn it into a, a CD or a set of audio tapes? Or can I add some video and turn it into a DVD set? Is it a topic that's hot enough that I can actually turn it into a, say a live seminar or class? You know, can I take the recordings from, say, this call, uh, print them out, put them in a binder, add some more stuff to it, related stuff, and call it a course and sell the course. You know, you look at, I look at how many different formats I can repackage the same information in by adding to it, by uh, breaking it into its component parts. And so you can do the research and put together, you can do the research, come up with the information once, and then produce a full range of products that go all the way, like I said, to a live uh, seminar or some type of live class or something. I'll make, that, that, that's a great idea. <laughs> you just gave me some ideas for one of my other products. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> that's terrific. Um, uh, some advice for people just starting out. How do you actually uh, position yourself in the marketplace that you want to be in? I, I like to uh, establish myself as the expert on, on a, whatever the topic is. And, and then once I've done that, then I, I have to decide what price range I want to charge. Uh, you have to decide, do I want to, what customers, which of the customers in the marketplace do I want to go after? You can't go after everyone. So you have to decide, well, do I want to uh, um, sell to the ones who are looking for the, the lower end or the higher end or, or somewhere in the middle? You have to study the marketplace and decide where you want to position yourself. I like to position myself in the higher end lately just because it's less work. Uh, but you, you study the marketplace and you decide which of the customers you want to serve because you can't serve them all. And what's nice about the information age is that you don't have to be an expert in any uh, topic today, and you can be by tomorrow. You know, well, maybe not that quickly, but you, you, you know what I mean. It's it's, it's a wonderful world. <laughs> yeah, I, I I position myself as an expert by writing a lot, for example, and I could very easily hire someone to go out do the research, write. But because I enjoy writing and it comes naturally, I write most of my own material. But someone reads something you've written. There's something magic about having written something you know, that, that makes you an authority. And there's something magic about something being in writing that once it's in writing, it's true. <laughs> it's true. You know, it, it's very powerful, very I powerful. It shouldn't be abused, here. but, you know, it's like once something is in writing, whether it's, it's uh, like I, I one time was branded the king of paper clicks, and that happened because Marlon Sanders at a seminar uh, was giving his presentation, and, and he knew I was doing a lot with paper clicks, and so he just threw that title at me, and I said, can I quote you on that? He said, sure. So in all my copy, I started putting that Marlon Sanders called me the king of paper clicks, or I used the title, put it in quotation marks, and put Marlon's name after it. You know, and that, that instantly gave me uh, credibility. That instantly, position, instantly positioned me in the marketplace as the expert on the topic, you know. I do remember that. Yeah, that's come to think of it. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Well, that's a great idea. Um <clears throat> Tell, tell us a little bit about how you promote your products and, and why you promote them in the way that you do. Uh, how, how I promote my products? I, I promote them primarily just from uh, from, from web pages uh, lately, uh, and, I, and I, I'm selling mostly as uh, information products, uh, as ebooks, as uh, MP3s, things like that. I don't. I, I there, there's a big trend to put together huge packages of uh, higher end products, you know, that are 15 DVDs and things along that line. And that's great if you have a topic that supports putting something that big together. But uh, otherwise, you just create a, a smaller product that's, you know, $97 or less, and it's a bunch of MP3s, maybe with the uh, transcript extra. And you just write, write up a very simple web page and drive traffic through it. And, and I do that because... There, there's a very low delivery cost. Uh, there's no physical product to spoil, and, and it's very fast to produce. I mean, I can send a, a recording from a call over to my transcriptionist and have it back in a day and, and turn it into a PDF, go through it, read it uh, to make sure it's fairly accurately transcribed, make some of the links to things I've mentioned, hyperlinks so that I've built in that back end, and I, and I have a product just that quick that I, I can put up a web page and start selling. Excellent. <laughs> um, what about direct mail? Do, do, do you do anything with direct mail in your business? I do, but it's because I sell products like cookbooks where 
uh, it's a product people prefer having the physical version of. I also was taught by some very knowledge, very wise people that we internet marketers, we constantly think about building our, our email list, but we need to be thinking about building our database, which should include mailing addresses too. Uh, because if you sent out, uh, I don't know, 10,000 emails and you sent out 10,000 letters, you're probably going to get five times the response from the, the physical letter. It, it, it it, it it's just uh, more well, it's tangible, and people just respond better to direct mail if it looks nice than they do to an email. And the email doesn't necessarily get through. You you assume the mail is going to get through. Although if you study direct mail marketing, you'll know that if it's bulk mail, that a lot of mailmen just toss it too. You know, I think that's a great way to get an edge on on, on some of your. Uh competition slash uh, potential partners because not many internet marketers use direct mail uh, uh, from what I've seen. Uh, it, what's your take on that? And it, it depends on what you're selling to. I mean, one of the things I sell a lot of is seminar seats, which is an, a form of information. It's packaging live presentations of information. And I use uh, greeting cards. I use letters. Uh, I, I use a, a system called Send Out Cards that lets me uh, put the greeting card together on the computer, on the Internet, and then send it out just by entering the, my database. And I can scan in an image of like a discount coupon, send the card out, and it says, you know, I'll give you 200 bucks off this seminar or whatever. And that works well for me. I've had seminars where I was the top uh, selling uh, affiliate because I've used tactics like that. So uh, I like direct mail. Um, I believe that if you're going to send out uh, a physical product that every package should have package inserts, Selling other back end products, and, and again, you you, know, you shouldn't just build a mailing list. You should be building a database, and you should be building a database that you're actually segmenting and mining. Uh, I I mentioned I'm going to be speaking in Sydney, Australia, in uh, in November actually. So I I will you know send an email, maybe a letter to my list members who are in Australia. I'll be in London in September. I will send an email and or a letter to my list members who are in the UK. Uh, it, it makes perfect sense. Oh, yeah. But if you don't, when you're building your list, somehow collect that data. And, and, you know, a lot of people when they opt into your list aren't going to give you all that information. But if they later purchase a product from you, you certainly have it in your database. That's true. You know, uh I've actually talked to others about, uh, you know, modifying your opt-in form to, to have them include addresses, phone numbers, even if it's not required. Uh, uh, studies have shown that the responses aren't as bad as you might think. People actually give you more information uh, if just because simply the fields are there. So, uh, you know, do you suggest uh, changing your forms for, for just any type of site or, or more towards a, a, a specific niche? It, 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 it depends on a lot of factors such as... Uh, how much loyalty you have with your audience and things like that, how well they know you. If you're running a project where your purpose is, say, to build a uh, an email list, and, and these are uh, freebie seekers, you know, you're offering them some free product, and you don't even know these people, you just threw uh, an ad out there or something, offering a free report in hope of building an email list, well, you, have, you can... You can you can only get so much information out of them because they don't know you, and a lot of them are going to give you even phony email addresses, but if it's... If you're, if you're selling something that's a higher value or you're offering something that's a higher value, you can certainly demand more in return for. And uh, it's one of those things you want to test. You want to uh, ask for an address and see how that works or whatever. A lot of people who do teleseminars, for example, ask for phone numbers. I, that, for some people that makes perfect sense because there are people who – use two-step marketing, and step one is to get them on a teleseminar, and step two is to have someone on the staff follow up with them with a phone call trying to upsell them on a product. Sure. But if you're not going to physically call them, then don't ask for the phone number because a lot of people don't like giving out their phone numbers. But I think they'll give you the address before they'll give you the phone number a lot of times. Yeah, I know. I found myself doing that, too, giving my address, uh, when really there's there's no reason to, but I find myself doing it anyway. <laughs> yeah, you... Um, it, it, it's one of the things you want to test, but again, as you're building your, your customer list, your subscriber list, whatever, you, you're really building a database, and you want to collect as many pieces of information as you can because, say, you're, you're going to be in a certain city. It'd be nice to uh, email your list members or mail your list members and say, I'm going to be in this city and would love to you know, meet up with you. 
Well, that's a great way to build more more customer loyalty as well. Huh? It is, yes. Absolutely. Well, I'll tell you, we've gotten some, some wonderful information out of you uh, uh, tonight, and I'm really glad we, we've been doing this call. But uh, I want to just ask, uh, do you have any additional tips or, or, or things you want to offer to the listeners uh, about anything? Yeah, we, 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 we did uh, zip through it quite quickly, didn't we? I mean, the, uh, but, uh, yeah, one of the things that I want to say is, is don't overanalyze when you're thinking of creating an information product. You want to test by letting the market prove to you that there's demand for the product, and then once you've got it proven, go ahead and, and do the product and get it out there, and uh, uh, then you can improve upon the, the website. You know, there, there are so many people that I've worked with over the last two years who had a product and had a website but weren't even promoting it because they weren't happy with the website. It wasn't perfect, uh, but you can't make sales until you start driving traffic to the site and then start making improvements. So Analysis paralysis, I think they call that? Yeah, just <laughs> get it out there in the marketplace. And uh, and then once you have it in the marketplace, if it's not selling, you, you, you test things and you make changes. And if you just can't make it work, you move on. You don't, you don't uh, fall in love with the idea and refuse to give up on it because some things won't work. Uh, again, that's learning from your mistakes. And... You know, I've studied copywriters. Uh, I've, I've studied some of the greatest copywriters it, alive today, and and they'll all tell you they've had failures. And some, in fact, some of them have had more failures than they have successes. But the successes were so big, you know, that they they were they're a thousand times over overshadowed the failures. And and uh, so you have to be willing to take risk. You know, we. And on the Internet, we, we lead people to the impression that it's easy and that you can't fail and all that. But if it were too easy, everybody in the offline world would be online. You know, Who, who would want to go to work at a, an office job if you knew beyond a shadow of a doubt you couldn't fail You know, just from plugging, plugging something into a formula and just doing it? Sure, absolutely. Okay, what I'd like to do is uh, we did get a handful of questions from, from our list. Uh, I'd like to, you know, kind of go through a couple of them here. Okay, I can do that, and then we could also uh, open the lines up after we uh, finish the ones that were emailed in or whatever. Okay, all right. Well, this, this first uh, question comes from uh, Henry McCollum. Uh, <clears throat> Uh, he's actually uh, written a, a several-part question. I'll, I'll start with the first part here. Uh, what are the logistics and costs involved in setting up and, and delivering information products if you already have a personal website? And uh, um, I like to sell every one, almost every one of my products from its individual website, first of all. So when he uses the term personal website, you know, if, if it's uh, Henry McCollum dot com, that may work. But I mean, Willie dot com works. But a, a site that suggest what the product's about better is better and I believe in having a separate site since the domain name is only eight dollars and you can get hosting for ten to fifteen dollars a month or less. Uh, so I believe you need a, a separate website for any major product and then the logistics of setting up and selling uh an information product depends on what the product is. It, the easiest one is just a product that's that's uh, physically Downloaded from the web, an MP3, a PDF, or a streaming video, and all that is is once you get it in the final form, uploading it to your website, uh, setting up an order page using a, a payment processor. You can have your own merchant account or PayPal or uh, ClickBank, and, and those are all easy to configure. Uh, don't require substantial investment up front. Those take the payment and. And in a day or two, that payment shows up in your usually your business checking account. But as soon as somebody, someone fills out the order form, you've configured it so they click on a link and it takes them to a download page, and they click on that link and download the product. And it can, can all be hands off uh, if you do a good enough job in setting it up. You have to really, really, really explain every step of the download process, though, else you'll get people calling and emailing saying, I. I opened that PDF book, and when I closed it, it went away, <laughs> you know, because they never even downloaded to the computer. Yes, I, I've had uh, many questions just like that, uh, especially in a, in, in a business like script installation like I've been in for the last several years. Uh, you wouldn't believe some of the questions, but they're understandable when you don't really have the, the background. So <laughs> Right, right. And, 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 and explain everything as, as clearly as you can, sure. That's another reason I don't like the really, really cheap products. It's like, say so you're selling a, 
an e-book, you're thinking, well, I'll, I'll make a million sales by selling it's only $5 each. Well, you're going to get a lot of people who are going to contact you and, and have problems with maybe the download or whatever, and you don't really want, you know, the for a $5 ebook that have to handle a lot of customer service issues, although you should be outsourcing most of that anyway, probably. Sure. Uh, depending uh, on how, how much you've grown your business. But so that's my, my answer is that you can go through ClickBank or PayPal or something like that, and it's very simple just to follow the instructions on their site to set up a, uh, a process for delivering the product to the customer. That's great. You just answered uh, one of his other questions about the, the tools that, that are available that can make information product marketing easier and more cost efficient. <clears throat> ClickBank and things like that uh, certainly uh, uh, can do that for you. Uh, another question he had was, uh, what are some of the pitfalls to avoid in setting up and delivering information products? Uh, one, of, one of my pet peeves is to make sure the information product you have is a quality information product. Um, you, you're going to have you know a few returns and, and uh complaints or whatever anyway, but if you really, really make it a good information product, uh, you you won't have, I have very, very few returns, and uh, you also want to under-promise and over-deliver if you can, that is, you know, throw in extra bonuses, uh, try to cut back on the, the hype or the hyperbole if you can, and make the product much more than what you promised. And you'll you'll wow your customers so much that they'll they'll come back and they'll buy from you over and over again. It makes perfect sense. It, it sounds logical, but uh, with, with seeing some of the hype I've seen, and I'm sure you've seen, uh, it seems that not everybody follows that advice. <laughs> but it's so easy to just throw in an extra bonus or something, or, you know. Oh sure. Okay, we've got another one here from uh, uh, Karen Cantelli. Uh, hi, Willie and Michael. I'm very interested in creating, publishing, and selling multimedia products especially covering streaming video and CD-ROMs how-to. Uh, how do we create the recordings and deliver them? Any advice on this subject would be appreciated. And I don't do a lot of that myself, uh, so I'm, I'm not really the best person to ask about that. What I do a lot of is uh, when I need to explain to someone how to do something that I'm very good at, I, I create a lot of Camtasia videos. There's a piece of software called Camtasia, that's available at techsmith.com. That's T E C H S M I T H dot com. And what Camtasia does is it captures whatever is on your computer screen or, or a section of your screen. You can tell it to capture the whole screen or just some section that you've designated. And as you're working through a process, so you're teaching someone how to do something, you're actually surfing from site to site, you're actually using a piece of software, you're actually doing some process, you can capture that. As you're doing it on your computer, you can have a microphone. You can actually explain it as you're doing it. Or you can go in after you've done it and, and just videotape it, a video it from your computer, and, and add the instruction later. And Camtasia lets you then go in, separate the audio and video into separate tracks, and then just uh, go through it inch by inch if you want to and cut out the parts you didn't like or whatever. It's, it's a very powerful tool, and that's what you see that's what's used to create a lot of these these videos you see uh, that are passed around in the internet marketing arena, in particular. Yeah, um, I started using Camtasia about a year ago, and, and it's a very simple program to to learn and use, and it's very very powerful. I I would recommend it too. I, I love Camtasia. I mean, and I I work with clients to where I I charge an hourly fee for consulting, and I don't want to you know do things that they can do themselves, but you know like uploading files and editing things or whatever. So a lot of those I find existing Camtasia videos for, but if I find myself explaining to a, a new client enough times how to do something, I'll take you know 10 or 15 minutes and create a, a video of how to do it, and then I'll have it handy for anyone else that I have to explain it to later. So it, it saves time. For sure. <laughs> I know uh, with with my with my script install business once again I I do a lot of uh, how to uh, uh, flash presentations with Camtasia on uh, you know so people can do some of the things themselves and save themselves a few dollars so yeah it's a it's a powerful tool absolutely and another thing is uh, I I haven't done that much video uh, I've done a lot of audio and I know that with audio something as simple as this call right now it's being recorded uh, on the bridge line and. I'll get a, a wave format file, uh, and I can import that into any of a hundred different audio editing programs, and uh, 
cut out the parts, all the ums and ahs. I can add music to the front end and back end. I can cut it into shorter pieces. And then I can have the software output it in any of ten different formats. You know, so if I want MP3 or or one of the other streaming audio types, I can do that with any any of a number of pieces of software. I use one called Audacity, for example, to do a lot of my audio editing. Uh, but you could just go to any search engine and look for audio editing software or even free audio editing software, and you'll find some very good software that lets you take a recording and change it into a number of different formats and, and pretty it up. That's it's a slight learning curve, but it, it, it's worthwhile if you're going to do a lot of it. Otherwise, uh, you can just get someone who does that for a living to do it for you inexpensively. Oh, sure. Yeah, you're right. It's, it's, a, uh, it's an instant product builder right there, like, we, what, like you've been talking about all evening. Uh, record a, a conversation with an expert, and you've got it recorded. You edit it. You put it together. You, you market it. You transcribe it, and boom, you've got an instant product. So yeah. You if you want it to sound really good, you you put the music on the front end and the back end, something that's appropriate, you know, that, that uh, lifts the spirit or whatever, you know, makes it sound like it's a major production. It, actually, I think you can even get those those intro music clips someplace online too. I'll have to find that. <laughs> uh, yeah, um, Mike Stewart, who calls himself the Internet Audio Guy, he sells some CDs uh, that are called front and back music. But there's a lot of sites that have royalty free music. You just look for free royalty free music or, or music clips or whatever, and you you'll find sites that have them. The thing is, the sites that have it, the free music often have just a very limited selection. Sure. You know, but you can buy a CD for probably twenty dollars. That's got you know a thousand different pieces of music on it. That's all royalty free. Terrific. Okay, got another email here from uh, Earl Adkins. He's, um, it's kind of a multi-part question as well, and, and this is a question that I know a, a lot of people uh, always have questions about, and uh, the answer is obvious to some and, and not to others uh, like myself. So, uh, this is also asking for myself: What's a surefire way to build a nice big loyal list? A surefire way to build a nice, big, loyal list. And uh, is there even such a thing? <laughs> y you, you can build a big list fast, and you can build a loyal list slow, but it, it's hard to build a, a really big, loyal list fast because you have to bond with that list. You have to... Uh, people join your list for a very specific reason. You know, you promised them you were going to deliver something to them, uh, some type of say content and they expect that from you and as long as you deliver that to them over and over and over again they'll stay on your list as soon as you start delivering things that they didn't join for they get off your list and so your list stops growing uh, it, it's easy to get subscribers it's harder to keep them and uh, uh, the, one of the easiest ways to build a, a list is, it would be to run a pay-per-click campaign where in the campaign you offered uh, some type of free item that's related to what the, the topic or the niche that you're in and you know you're going to pay five to ten cents maybe per list member but that's not much compared to some other methods you can also um, do cross promotions with people where you you get them to send you their new subscribers or encourage their new subscribers to join your list too uh, for example I, I have a subscriber box on my page and when the person fills in the information and clicks the submit button the thank you page says, uh, here are a few other newsletters I recommend, or something along that line. That, that, that's worked well for me in the past. Uh, uh, you can write articles, which is one of the things I do, and in your resource box you send them to your website and encourage them to join your list. And, what, and where most people mess that up is they write a really good article maybe, but they don't tell the reader to take some action, like go to my website and join my list for more information. You know, instead they just say, you know, this is who I am, and that's basically it. They don't tell them, you know, to to go ahead and join their list, and that's, and that's very important. And I, I, I was uh, another one of those mistakes that I made early on in, in my online career, writing uh, articles and, and not putting much of a resource box in. You know, uh, that's that's very important to do too. <laughs> yeah, you want to say if you really enjoyed this great information, you can go get more here. And not only can you go get more, but you need to go get more. Right. Right. Because people. Or was it J. Abraham says people are begging to be led? Makes sense to me. Um, another part of Earl's question is uh, he's asking about uh, the, the crafting of the landing page or, or your opt-in page. 
Uh, should it be as, as, as big as a sales page with, with tons of information on there or uh, just a little quicker, you know, hey, subscribe, this is what you'll get? Uh, you, you have to actually sell people on the value of joining your list. So it depends upon what's driving them to the page. If something out there is pre-selling them, i.e. you write an article that proves that you really know your stuff on some topic, uh, and that article says, uh, for more great information from from, uh, from Mike, click through to the site and sign up for his newsletter. Then the, the visitor arrives at your site pre-sold. But if you're not doing a, a good job at pre-selling them, then you need to do more selling on the, the landing page. Okay. Now, now uh, we, we spoke a little earlier about uh, Jonathan Mizell, and uh, uh, he, I, he put together uh, a a process called the name squeeze page. Right. Can you tell us a little bit about that? Um, how do you find that that works for increasing your opt-in rate? Does, does, does it work well? Or does it work well only in certain situations? Or and do you recommend using them? Well, the, the the way that the name squeeze page the name squeeze page is a page where when someone lands on the site, there's a subscriber box and they can't get past the front page of the site until they sign up. So they, their choice is to subscribe or leave. Generally speaking. And if what brought them to the page was something very enticing, say an email that was sent out maybe by one of your joint venture partners that did a tremendous job of selling them on the value of something that maybe was a free report or something on your site, the person arrives at the site and, and they're, they want to get at what's behind that name squeeze page, then it will work well. Uh, so it, it's really a matter of they've got to be... Uh, hot and bothered when they arrive at that page. They've got to you know, be, be wanting what's there. Otherwise, they're not going to give you their, their information. Okay. That, well, that makes a whole lot of sense. <laughs> okay. Um, I mean, and, and I watch uh, Stephen Pierce uh, do it masterfully. You know, you, you, you read some of his sales letters or emails you get, and, and you want the freebie or the, the video or whatever. And so you hit this page, and before you can go any farther, you've got to fill in the form. Yeah, I actually use the name squeeze on one of my pages, and, and it has actually increased my subscribe rate for that particular uh, that that niche that, I, that I'm marketing a, an ebook in. So uh, it, it it has actually worked quite well uh, for me in, in it, that instance. It's also asking yourself what what are you trying to do with with, with your your business? And for a lot of internet marketers, the most important thing is to build the list because you're only going to sell a certain percentage on the first contact, and if you don't capture information. You spent all this time and effort to get into the page, and they spent uh, a minute on the page and they left, never to come back to your site ever, ever, ever again. So if you think of it in those terms, uh, a lot of people think that number one is capturing the, informa the contact information so you can follow up with them later. Okay, and, now and even if you want to sell them on that first visit, you capture their contact information, then you send them to a page that's a sales page. Ah, uh, Okay, I see how that would work, sure. Now, I, I kind of want to jump back real quick uh, before we open up uh, the phone line for some questions. And this is in regard to uh, uh, product bonuses to, to go with, with, with a particular product you have. Now, I've heard the debate about, you know, uh, throwing in 100 different bonuses for a $20 ebook, or uh, in some cases I've even read a, a – a uh, sales page that at the bottom says, if you're looking for bonuses, you know, forget it. This, this product is worth ten times what any bonus would give you. Do you find that uh, that there's a, a right way or better way or a preferred way? Uh, lots of bonuses, very little bonuses, strictly relevant bonuses or no bonuses at all? Uh, I use uh, very few bonuses on most of my pages uh, because I reason that you have to test, but I reason that if uh, I offer too many bonuses and the value of the bonuses is way, way more than the value of the product, that maybe people will wonder what's wrong with the product and they won't purchase. You know, um, But I also see people using bonuses where they don't spend enough time selling the bonus, i.e. they list 20 different products, but they don't tell what the product's going to do for the end user. And, and that's useless. You need to make sure the bonus is relevant and related to whatever else they purchased, and you need to sell them on the value of the bonus. Tell them what the bonus is going to do for them. List its uh, points, because it could be one of those benefits you list from one bonus that sells the customer rather than the primary product. 
Uh, yeah, and I can see where, where being relevant would, 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 um, would be kind of obvious. Like, for example, uh, you're very big on, on selling uh, cookbooks, and you would hate to offer a, a bonus on uh, uh, Internet marketing. It, it probably wouldn't uh, <laughs> fare well. <laughs> yeah, they, they would think, well, what's this going to do with it? And it would actually distract them. Would yeah. throw them out of the sales message because in the back of their mind they'd be thinking, what's this got to do with anything? And, and that would that could lose your sales. You you don't want to do anything in your sales process that makes your customer think. There's even a book out there called Don't Make Them Think. Don't make sense. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Because I know it's actually true because most people impulse buy or buy on emotions anyway. I, I know I'm guilty of that almost every day, in fact. <laughs> right. We buy on emotion, then we justify later. Yes, that's right. <laughs> okay, well, uh, I, like I said before, I think this has been uh, uh, very informative. Uh, what I'd like to do now, uh, if, if it's okay with you, is open up the uh, the line to see if we, uh, any of our listeners have any questions for you. Sure. Um, I, I'll... You're now mute. Out. Hello, who we got out there tonight? And, and we'll ask that you uh, only only unmute your phone by hitting star six when you're ready to ask the question, and that way we'll keep the noise down. Hey, anybody wants to ask Willie a question, just go ahead and speak right on up. Charlotte Hyatt here. I have a question about the info products you keep mentioning. Does that include fiction, or are they all... Uh, things you need to research. I, uh, when I think info products, I generally think of, of uh, nonfiction. Um, but I, because um, I, I have no experience with selling fiction, uh, so I don't, I don't know how it mark, how you'd market it really. All right, thank you. Another question. You've mentioned that we could do a teleseminar with someone prominent in the industry and tape that. How do you go about taping a phone interview? That there are um, conference call companies. Companies that provide lines that l allow multiple callers on them. And if you just type in uh, into a search engine conference calls, or conference lines, you'd, you'd find a dozen companies, some of which are even free. There's one called freeconferencecalls.com, for example. As long as you don't have more than, I think it's uh, 75 or so, it may be a different number, but as long as you don't exceed a certain number of calls on the line, uh, you can even get free lines. After you go up into the higher numbers, then you have to pay for the line. Uh, and I know I, a long time ago, used freeconferencecall.com, and they, they gave me a dedicated number that any time I wanted to do a conference call, I just used that number, but I was limited to, I think, 75 callers for that service. And then they, uh, for an extra fee, allow you to enter a code on your phone that records the call, and they will transfer that call to you either on a CD or send it to your web server. Thank you. Sure. Any more questions out there? I think most of our, our uh, people in the UK and places like that are probably asleep by now. <laughs> Any more questions? Well, this is easier than I, than I thought it would be. I have a question. If, <clears throat> excuse me, if you have time. Sure. Uh, one of my questions is about the, uh, you talked about keeping a copywriting swipe file. Have, have you found some of the, uh, the sales material to be better, or have you tried uh, adding several of those together to, to get a good result, and, and what kind of results have you seen from that? I, I have uh, a number of copywriting courses. One's a uh, course put together by Yannick Silver. <laughs> He calls it his ultimate at-home copywriting course, and that's at uh, ultimateonlinecopymanual.com. That's ultimateonlinecopymanual.com. And basically, Yannick taught a multiple-day copywriting course where he videotaped the whole thing, and then he includes his swipe files in this course that's like four binders, four huge three-ring binders. And uh, I very often... 
just I mean, there are certain headlines, there are certain guarantees, there are certain ways of writing it that work over and over and over again, and you can take pieces of that and just plug it in. So I just take pieces. I mean, like Dan Kennedy's writing style was to make it sound like he crawled, you know, uphill, naked, <laughs> across broken glass to put together the product he's selling you dirt cheap. You know, he, he builds so much value, and, and then he makes it sound like such a bargain. And... Uh, so I, I, I use that in some of my copy, for example. It, it, there's certain things that, that you notice, and you just you can, and they have what they call like an apples to oranges comparison, where you, you point out the value of something by comparing it to something else, which really you can't compare. So I use a lot of those techniques that I, I just basically uh, professional copywriters will take a headline. They have they have favorites, and, and they use those over and over again, and just change the words to make it fit the situation. And it's a lot easier than just starting from scratch, usually. On the, uh, on the guarantee, is it better to have a 90-day guarantee or or a longer guarantee? What what have you seen from that? I, I like longer guarantees. The thing is that uh, Visa and MasterCard, uh, after 90 days, then the rules on chargebacks and things like that change. So they don't like you giving longer than a 90-day guarantee, but I, I've given... Lifetime guarantees. I've given one-year guarantees, and uh, longer guarantees do work because people feel that if they only have a week. They've got to really quickly decide whether or not they like the product. But if they've got a year, uh, it's a good chance they'll stick the product on the shelf and not even notice until a year later or whatever. Okay. It's, and it just shows that you have confidence in your product. Okay. Well, uh, thank you very much. I have a question. Can you hear me? Yes. Um, you, in your research um, tools uh, discussion, you mentioned a um, uh, manual. It was a standard, uh, something I didn't get it. It was the SRDS. SRDS. SRDS is a, uh, it's, it's actually a, a book of, of, what, of lists that are available to uh, for different markets, you know, and, and it shows it, it, it uh, tells you how many, it, it shows you certain lists are available, how many people on those lists and what the people on those lists purchased. So if you wanted a list of uh, dog owners that purchased uh, a fur jacket, you know, from a certain company, some of those companies will sell you those lists and they'll even, if you request it, send you a copy of the sales piece they used to sell whatever they sold. Uh, but it shows you... Groups of people that all took a common action and, and the company built a list that's now available through this book. You can also find more information at www.srds.com. They, they do have a site. Yes. But, you know, it basically shows you, it gives you an idea of, of all the different niches that are out there so you can look and find something and see if there's enough people interested on a given topic to make, maybe make it worth you pursuing the, uh, the topic. Also, you mentioned um, in terms of the direct um, marketing or direct mail piece, sending out cards. Were you referring to postcards, that, that type of um, uh, yeah. learning? Yeah, I mean, it depends on what you're selling, but I, I use greeting cards because the company I work with uh, lets me use greeting cards almost like an autoresponder. I can upload a database to a system I use, and it'll, the system will we'll print out physical greeting cards that are personalized with the person's name and address and all that, and even inside, personally address them in the card. And so I use that system. Uh, if you want to look at that system, it's at sendoutcards.com forward slash Willie. Uh, that's my site, actually. It's sendoutcards.com forward slash Willie. And for, for less than uh, 50 cents, each, I send out full color, fully personalized greeting cards. I'm sorry, postcards. And for less than a dollar each, I send out fully personalized, full color greeting cards. You know, in a regular envelope with first class postage on them. So when somebody gets this card, you know, it looks like it's it is personalized. It's seems for it. Okay. Thanks a lot. I really appreciate the call and information tonight. I just wanted to say that. Sure. Thank you. We, we've got room, time for a few more questions. I don't want to keep you guys up too late, but I don't want to leave any questions unanswered. Uh, you know, you should pass over this opportunity to ask the questions. Well, if nobody else is asking a question, I've got another question. <laughs> your, your name? <laughs> My name is Kamal, Kamal Kenyatta. 
Hi, Kamal. What's your question? You had mentioned um, in terms of copywriting, uh, you check out John Reese's uh, page. Uh, could you share the uh, site again? I didn't. I wasn't able to write it down. That's uh, trafficsecrets.com. That's it. Trafficsecrets.com. And that the reason a lot of internet marketers are using that page is because John Reese sold over one million dollars worth of his product in a single day, and he was one of the first internet marketers to do that. Uh, what's deceptive about that, though, is that he had a lot of joint venture partners all promoting his product at the same time, and so even though it all came together in one day, he probably spent months or years developing a relationship with those marketers so they'd all mail his offer on one day and drive traffic to his site. So it, it's deceptive in that way, but it's a very good sales page. Any other questions? Yeah, how you doing, Willie? I'm doing great. Who am I, who am I uh, talking to? This is Don from Maryland. Uh, Hi, I gotta Don. Say, I've, I've been enjoying your emails. Um, I had a quick question for you earlier. You were talking about uh, letting the market tell you what it wants and testing uh, before you even have a product. Could you elaborate on that a little more? Well, well the way I do it is... Uh, I look for a product that's very similar, and then I actually offer that product for sale from my website. And, and if, if a similar product won't sell, there's a good chance my product won't sell. And you can ask the market, you know, by a survey or something, you know, would you guys like to purchase this? But they will tell you often in a survey what they think you want to hear. But when they're voting with their, their wallets and actually buying the product, that proves to you that it would sell, that something similar should sell. Right. Okay. And so I, I'll actually write a sales. I'll, I'll actually drive traffic using pay per clicks to a sales page that pre sells them, captures their contact information, and then sends them on to the affiliate site. And then I actually watch are they buying the product? If they say they want it and they're not buying the product, uh, either I need to create one that's much better or they're just not going to buy it and it's not worth my time. Right. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Sure. I have a I have a question. Can you hear me? I sure can. And your name? Imani. Imani, okay. Uh, yes, I'm just getting started, and I would like to know what steps I should take to get started once I have my niche. Um, what? Where do I get my website? How do I get it up? Stuff like that. Uh, you. It, it depends on your your niche, I suppose. But you can go to any. Uh, Internet Marketing Discussion Board, for example, and, and ask for someone to help you in putting together a site. There's tens of thousands of programmers and uh, web designers out there who work fairly inexpensively, and almost any web hosting company is as good as almost any other. It's almost a commodity. Uh, the only difference is the ones that cost more can afford to have better technical support. You know, if, if you're only paying $10 a month for web hosting, they can't really afford to have somebody sitting around waiting for problems, and so it'll take you longer maybe to get customer service if you need it. But uh, almost any web hosting company is as good as any other. It's just a disk space they're selling you, really. And uh, you... Uh, go to an internet marketing discussion forum, introduce yourself, and say I'm looking for a programmer or a designer, and you'll get thousands of people. Oh, wow. Okay. <laughs> what do you think about Yahoo's web hosting? I haven't really looked into it, but I know that they've built in a lot of extras that you know, help you in your search engine rankings and things along that line. I just I haven't really studied it that close. I know uh, Andy Jenkins and Brad Fallon are big on it, for example. I, I can jump in uh, on a technical side of that. Uh, as somebody, again, who has installed script and done web hosting, uh, they're very good in a lot of ways, but it's very difficult if you wanted to, say, for example, install your own autoresponders uh, and, and run your own list and stuff like that. It's it's very difficult to do certain things like run, uh, uh, you know, automated uh, tasks on a Yahoo-type server. Um, they they will help you, but it it's, it usually takes several hours to a day to get an answer out of them. So that's the the caveat to a, a service like Yahoo. You you have to operate within their confines, and if you want to yeah. do something out of the ordinary, uh... yeah. And they don't give you as much access to your back office or your panel, uh, so to speak, as you would on a web host that uses, say, uh, a C panel type uh, system. 
Hmm. Okay. Hi, Willie. This is Diane. Is, Hi, Diane. Is, uh, do you have any recommendations for someone that has their own server, and this may be a little more you know, advanced than someone just starting out, but um, for a very large list, do you have any recommendations in terms of which software um, to use that is reliable for um, maybe, you know, 100,000 people? Yeah, and I use third party. So, uh, Michael, you, you are probably better qualified than I am for that one. Well, large list, um, I can tell you this much about uh, web hosts. Uh, they don't like it. Um, and I, and I, I say that because I am a web host. And it's not that I don't like it. It's just that when you're in a shared server environment and you have a list of 100,000, it wreaks havoc on a server that has, say, 100 other clients also running lists and, and other back you know, you know, uh, processes that, that go on behind the scenes. Sure. Um, I'm, I'm going to interrupt real, real quick. I, um, sure. I have uh, my own server, so that's not. Ah, okay. Yeah. Got so it. you're looking for <laughs> software. Software, right? And I've used I, I've used something like MailLoop, which you know goes direct, which is okay. What I what I don't like about that is that there's no way, or I haven't found a way to actually track the clicks. Oh. And I, you know, I was hoping I could come. Well, the, one of the most popular ones online right now is uh, Auto Response Plus. Okay. Uh, that's uh, I don't know if you have you heard of them. I have. Yeah. Okay. They they have a lot of built-in extra features such as link tracking, uh, tracking tags, open rate, uh, and, and a whole bunch of other features that, as a marketer, uh, they come in real handy. Great. Uh, uh, you do have to pay, I believe, a yearly license now. Uh, I'm not sure, but uh, uh, but it's it, if you're serious about um, you know mailing to a list and tracking that stuff, it's probably a very good solution for you. Excellent. Thank you so much. I appreciate it. Okay. And and one more, I've got one more follow up question for you, Jen Willie. This okay. Is Diane. Um, if you decide to make a product out of this conference call, would there be any way that the listeners could get an email when that's available so that we could kind of see your process? Um, yes, we'll, we'll okay. send a list of when the product is available. Perfect. Thank you. Sure. Any other questions? Uh, we've gone about an hour and a half, so uh, we'll take one or two more and then uh, call it a night. Yeah, Willie, this is... Uh, Brian from Denver, Colorado. I'm Hi, Brian. Michael at the uh, Mega Seminar. Great, great. I've really enjoyed meeting you guys you? here. Doing good. good. Doing fine, thanks. Um, I think this question may have been asked, answered at the Mega Seminar, but I wanted to get your opinions on it. I've heard mixed opinions on the use of Google uh, AdSense on a, on a website or blog site. Okay. Uh, some people have said they've made some decent money off it. Some people have said they haven't done that well. Um, would you recommend putting it on a, a Google AdSense program on, on your blog site? I, I do have one on my site, on most okay. of my sites. Okay. The, the thing is, uh, anytime you think about putting anything on a web page, you have to ask, you, you have to ask what's going to bring you the most money or the most whatever you're trying to accomplish. So I don't put it on my sales pages naturally, but on just the blog, uh, it's a, you put it there and you see if it decreases other actions that you desire. I, I have blogs that uh, make me thousands of dollars a month uh, running Google AdSense plus uh, affiliate products. I mean, blogs hosted on free services like Blogger. Right, and that's the one I, I use too, blogger.com. Yeah, that, I mean, that works. It's, it's, you just have to integrate the AdSense code into the blog in a, in a way that feels natural and put it in a place where they're likely to click on the link. And then you... You maybe swap out AdSense with some affiliate product and see which one's selling the best. Or okay. make you the most. That's fun. great. Thanks a lot. Sure. Okay, Michael, do you think we should uh, go ahead and, and wrap it up then? Sure. Let's we'll go ahead and wrap it up. I'd like to thank everybody for for joining us. Uh, I I don't know about you, but I got a lot of great information uh, out of Willie. It's it's always a pleasure to speak to him as well. So uh, Willie, I, I'd like to say thank you to you also. Thank you. My pleasure. Okay, thank you. And we will, we'll be sending an email out to everyone letting you know how you can get these uh, recordings later on.